on this episode of I'm Not a Lawyer, but the debrief. Well, I don't know because it was inadvertent. Well, it's kind of like a butt dial. Your testimony, let me just ask. Is sure. Your testimony that you and your wife were in the middle of some sort of sexual or intimate situation, and that's what caused you to butt dial the phone at that time at 2.22 a.m.? Listen, that's what I said. I said it's a booty call. It's literally a booty call. <laughs> now, if you're not ready, then go ahead and tell me you're not ready. I object to you getting records. You've been intrusive into people's personal lives. In other words, the car didn't hit him, and he wasn't hit by the car. I'm not a lawyer, but... Are y'all keeping up? I'm not a lawyer, but... The debrief. Hello, welcome to another episode of... I'm not a lawyer. Oh, wait, we messed it up. Oh, I'll... <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh. Okay, here we go. Okay. Welcome to another episode of I'm Not a Lawyer, but the debrief. There we go. We got it together. Mm -hmm. I am Melanie, aka I'm Not a Lawyer, but, and I am joined by my co host, Gooseberry. How y'all doing? Somebody commented because you, oh, you it. didn't say how you, y'all doing. And I told him never again. You messed it up. Um, on this podcast, we are not lawyers. I am not a lawyer for sure, but we, uh, spend our time mm -hmm. learning, listening, watching uh, a lot of things that have to do with law, legal stuff. And then we come on this podcast and talk about it, review it, uh, give y'all the insight in case you have or haven't been watching and just want to talk about it. A lot of people were giving names uh, to like the segment that I've been doing at the beginning, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a, a few titles that we think are going to work for different segments. The first one is the mini bar, Mel's mini bar. Somebody, yeah. a lot of people recommended that. So we're going to call this first segment Mel's mini bar. Uh, then after the Mel's mini bar, there's another segment that we are calling sidebar, and that is really um, a segment in which is not going to be the main thing we're going to cover, but just like something that has come up that we want to discuss. So maybe a lawsuit, maybe something else, maybe YSL, maybe whatever. So that's the sidebar, and then we have open bar, and open bar is going to be uh, the main topic for the episode. So again, we are going to start with the mini bar. And I have been the mini bar. Yes, uh, Mel's mini bar. Mm -hmm. I have been reading about legal duty in law. Okay. Sure. And the general idea with like legal duty is that everyone, mm -hmm. okay, owes a duty to everyone else to not cause unreasonable risk or harm to them. So just in general, like as a like fellow a citizen here, mm -hmm. uh, you owe me the duty to not harm me. Right. OK. And so when you violate that, when you are in breach of that duty, you can be criminally prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so um, there are certain roles that you occupy, just like in life, uh, in which you are re in which you have like a legal duty to act or not act. Yep. And failure to do either of those could, again, make you held criminally responsible. So I'm going to kind of bring it down, which is. The story about the um, parents, the Michigan shooter, there was a, a, a man in Michigan, a child, his name was Ethan Crumbly, in which he went into his high school and uh, opened fire and ended up killing four students. Okay. His parents, a couple months ago, were Jennifer Crumbly, and I can't remember the father's name, maybe like Matt or something, but his parents were charged with involuntary manslaughter based on what their son did, Ethan Crumbly. And a lot of people have a lot of opinions about that. Like, how could they charge the parents? That's unfair, whatever. But what it really came down to is negligence in the fact that they had a legal duty to prevent their child from causing harm yep. to other people. And the and the way that that is uh, examined or like looked at is that it has to be foreseeable. I, I remember this. Yes. One. And so yep. if you as a person, a reasonable person, are able to foresee that your child is going to cause unreasonable harm to other people, it is then your responsibility and your duty to the rest of the world to prevent that from happening. Did you follow that? Yeah. Okay. And so that's essentially the way that they were able to be charged because they, the state argued 
they had enough information to foresee that he was going to do that and mm -hmm. they did nothing. So their failure to act yep. caused him, enabled him to do what he did. Mm. Okay. Hopefully y'all are following that. Um, Could you use that? Is that the same with uh, like your pets? Because you know your pet is aggressive and your pet ends up biting biting somebody because, because you didn't have them on the leash. And if they have a history of yes. biting people, you are then, you then have enough information to foresee that mm -hmm. they will bite again. Yeah. And if you do nothing to prevent that dog from biting again, mm -hmm. you can be held responsible. Makes sense. So there are different roles in which like you have legal duty. So if you think about like my sister is, uh, she worked in childcare, still she's a teacher now, but as a childcare provider, Child care providers have a legal duty to report abuse if they see signs of it. Ah, uh, yes. Exactly. That's, that's things, good. Yes. So it's things like that where okay. you have. And so when you are in violation of that, you could be criminally prosecuted. Yeah. Landowners, if you own land, you also have legal duties to <sighs> people that come on your land. So this is where it got interesting. I hope y'all are following. I'm smiling because we have a rental property. Yes, we do. And the entrance to the backyard, uh -huh. my tenant has said, mm -hmm. hey, can we pave this? Because it's hell for me to get back here with the lawnmower. And he sent me a picture and it's like a, it drops off. It's an embankment. Uh -huh. So I know now. You're saying this on a podcast, so now we got to really do it. But yes, I've gotten, I've gotten. You quotes. are, you are I'm, now. I'm in admitting. Yes, that we are in knowledge it, of this. Yes, but yes, I essentially, am. right? Like I'm snitching you, on myself. You are, uh, and us. But I've got quotes. I've gotten yeah, my quotes. Yeah, you got to do it this week. <laughs> are we getting it done? <laughs> yes, but uh, to that point, um, it's like many times if things happen at an establishment, let's say. Uh, I don't know, things happen at establishments. Many times people will sue the owners of that establishment mm -hmm. because they are saying that they should have been aware, they it should have been foreseeable and they yep. didn't do anything to prevent it. So now they are held responsible. So that's a lot of ways in which people sue companies or establishments, even if you know a person did something at the establishment, the establishment itself can be held responsible in, in this way. Okay. Um, so anyway, the reason I was bringing it up as I was reading is because what was what I read about that was interesting is that the example that they gave is if you are a landowner and people are constantly trespassing on your land, mm. even though they are trespassing on your land, because it is happening frequently, happening mm -hmm. frequently, you now owe a duty to them to inform them of any dangers on your land. Beware of dog. Beware of dog. If you were not to, you could be held responsible if they come on your land are, and are bitten because it is foreseeable that they are going to be trespassing on your land. If it is reoccurring, you can be held responsible. This is this is already triggering for me. Is it? <laughs> you done got me with the walk away. Growing up, mm -hmm. our dog, people cut through our yard uh -huh. to get to the pool. Yep. We had no beware of dog signs. Uh-huh. Our dog bit two guys going to the pool, mm. and we had to. Did we? No, we did. We had to put the dog down. Down. Yep. So be, it's and it's really about foreseeability. It's really about do you have yeah. enough information to predict that this will happen? If so, you have a duty to prevent it from happening. And we had enough information, but at that time it was like, all right. You gonna get bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what happened. And it's that's, I agree with that law, and I don't agree with it <laughs> because why are you cutting through our Absolutely. yard, yeah. thinking it's okay? Yeah. And now I have to make it safer for you, uh huh, to get through here, or at least inform them. You have to inform. Beware of dog. No. Oh, and so that's what we didn't do. And so one of one of the examples, and we can move on. But one of the examples in the example that I was reading, somebody trespassed onto land, and there was a hole in the land that the person trespassing wasn't aware of they fell in their leg got caught and and they were injured from that because people had been trespassing on that land that land owner had a duty to put up a sign that says hole here don't step here or uh -huh. they had a duty to cover it okay and if if the 
um, I forgot the way that they, there's a, like a equation, but basically if what it takes to amend or fix the issue is less uh, work than it is to not do so and then it causes harm, then that's essentially how you're held responsible. So anyway, there you go. There's Mel's mini bar. That's what I've been reading about this week It is your legal duty. Um, and there are a lot of instances, parents to children, they have legal duties, uh, professionals like in the medical field or child care professionals, they have a legal duty. Uh, people who like if you put your family member in a nursing home or something like that, like they have legal duties to those patients. Mm. Um, if you take someone into your home, even though you are not like necessarily their parent, you could still have a legal duty to care for them because you have now voluntarily uh, allowed them in your house and like taken on that caregiver role. Mm -hmm. So you could start to uh, have a legal duty and then of course, landowner. So anyway, uh, yeah. So that has was reasonable has to be reasonable. It's not like, you know, you have to do everything you it's reasonable. You have a legal duty to act as a reasonable person would. Okay. All right. That was a shot of information from the midi bar. Yeah. You got that? Yeah. A shot, a I little small it. shot I got it. from the mini bar. You're hilarious. Hey, yo. Uh, okay, now let's move on to sidebar. The sidebar um, is just something small that uh, I want to discuss, and we won't spend a ton of time on it, but uh, it has to do with YSL, and it has to do with lyrics in trials. What is your general opinion about the ability to use lyrics, music, art mm -hmm. in trial? I think if they are going to use it, they need to use it across all genres of music. Simple as that. Here's my question. Um, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how I should phrase my question or if I should just play this clip. My question is, mm -hmm. if you are a artist in whatever form mm -hmm. and you, let's say a painter, if you paint a person with a gun, right? Mm -hmm. Versus if you paint a person with a gun that's at the scene of a crime that is currently being investigated, do you feel like both of those, if they are used equally across all genres of art, do you feel like both of those are fair game? Does that make sense? Yes, I think they're both fair game okay. but obviously one depicts more information than the other yeah so i can literally see what's happening in this crime scene yeah now if you're an artist and you drew this uh -huh. and it looks exactly like the crime scene Ex right that that's... you're suspected of being in, right right then now it's almost like hold up are you telling on yourself right then, you know, then you have to, if it's a law, then you have to use it. If it's not a law, then, I mean, hey, he can, he's playing games now. So, uh, or she's playing games. I'm now. going to play this clip. Uh, I, my opinion typically has been if you uh, describe details from an incident from a crime, in your art in any form or fashion, and they are the specific details. This happened on this day, uh, and it was in this car with this type of weapon. Uh, it might feel like it should be used against you. If you are accused of a crime and you have a song in which you just say, I like guns and I have guns, I don't really feel like that, be in my opinion, becomes prejudice. It becomes uh like prejudicial toward the defendant, right? Like if you put that in front of a jury, just the fact that they have had guns in their life and now I'm accusing them of killing this person, that's unfair. But mm -hmm. if they talk about in their art, the specific incidents and details of the thing that they're accused of, I think that's different. Anyway, the reason that I bring it up is because last week in YSL, they had a gang expert, which is a, a, a officer who worked in the gang department, basically Atlanta PD. And they had a song of Thugs Up uh, young Thug, who's obviously a defendant in the YSL case, and they were essentially playing clips and then having him dissected. And it felt unfair to me 
Uh, but if you're listening, watching, doing whatever, I would love to hear your thoughts. I'm going to play it, um, and then you guys can see what I'm kind of talking about. Uh, this is Jimmy Winfrey, aka Pee Wee Roscoe, in the red city. That's uh, Diamante Kendrick, aka Yak Guy. Uh, Jeffrey Williams, aka Young Thug. And that's Mr. Webb, I don't remember his first name. Uh, he said that Lil Woody, aka Kenneth Copeland, would pull up and pop at your nugget, which shoot it to you. <laughs> This is Jimmy Winfrey. And he told me anything. He told me no salt, right? Let me go play on my kitchen. I'm betting they stick on full of like a wallet. If you hear the term, catch him down bad. Catch him down bad is just like a inner city phrase for like if I'm looking for somebody or if I'm looking for an adversary and I finally catch him. Like I caught you not paying attention. I caught you down bad. Like you weren't prepared for what was coming to you or something like that. He said the first clip was him saying, so Thug in the song says, uh, Woody gon' pop at your noggin. And then the detective said, pop at your noggin, which is, I'm gonna shoot at your head. But there is no, that I am aware of, in this YSL case, an accusation that Woody shot somebody's head off. Like, even the one where the man at the gas station, the sit-go incident, he was not included, he was not involved in that. And so the fact that they are able to like bring that in, it just feels very prejudicial. It feels like uh, you are allowing the, the jurors to judge him. You're giving them information that really has nothing to do with this case, but allowing them to say he is a bad guy who, who has guns. So it's more, he may have really done these crimes. You know what I'm saying? Well, was this, was the video depicting their character or were they saying listen to the lyrics because this is describing a crime scene because i think to your point them you to your point to them using this video to say hey they do have guns mm -hmm. look at mm -hmm. what they're doing they're smoking they're drinking so now you're looking at this person totally different i can look at somebody and meet them anywhere mm -hmm. in person uh -huh. and have an image of them in my head but then when i look at their instagram account yeah. be completely different, completely different. Right. so what if this was trying to say uh if they're trying to explain their their demeanor and this is how they act what's there's there's no difference from this than looking at their instagram accounts i agree so, and that's why i basically my opinion and i'm not a lawyer is that it is it's unfair I don't think that it's unfair to have this man who says he's a gang expert interpret lyrics. That's all laughing. Even his interpretation of down bad. Yeah, he it basically got jobs means, for everything. You know, but like I could use the phrase caught you down bad. And it doesn't mean that I, I caught my adversary and now I shot them in their head. Like that's not, uh, it doesn't have to be that. And it, it, it comes down to interpretation. And that's why this whole conversation gets sticky is because it really comes down to art is meant to be interpreted, uh, but it's also very subjective. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the open bar. Mm -hmm. Open bar, we are talking about Karen Reed. And I hope that you are following along with the case or at least watching my recaps on TikTok or maybe you're, or anywhere that I post them. And if not, that's okay too, because if you just are listening to this podcast and wanting the update, we finna give it to you because it's been a mess. It has been a mess. I love it. So let's go with, um, let's kind of recap the story. We so are hold going, on, hold on. Okay, Open bar is the, the, what, is the it's meat the, of everything. Yes. Okay. Open ball. We get into it. Okay. Right. Ten volt. So uh, I'm going to put up this again. This is kind of the chart and shout out to Brandy in church at Brandy in church. That is who made this. That's where I got this from. So if you want to go look at it or look at any of the other things that this account has posted, go do that. I don't know them. I'm just, it was on the internet. Um, so let's talk about the people. Okay. So, or what we know. Yep. Based on the last week of testimony, mm -hmm. what we know is that on January 28th, 2022, in Canton, everybody goes to the bar, the waterfall, the waterfall bar. bar. They have different reasons 
as to why they went or how they went or whatever. But basically, the night really starts at the Waterfall Bar. There is Brian and Nicole Albert, who are the owners of 34 Fairview Road, where John uh, O'Keefe's body was found the following morning. Okay, so there's Brian and Nicole. They're there. His, uh, Brian's brother, Chris, and his wife, Julie, they're there. Nicole Albert's sister, whose name is Jen McCabe, and her husband, Matthew McCabe, they're there. There's also Brian Higgins, who is a... Um, Colleague. A colleague, yes. Mm -hmm. And friends with Brian Albert. He's there. There's also Caitlin Albert, who is the daughter of Brian and Nicole, as well as her boyfriend. They're there. And then Karen Reed and John O'Keefe are also there. And Karen and Nicholas Colo Kinsis. Oh, and then these other, um, yeah, like third Colo party people Kinthis. who were there through Jen McCabe and Matthew McCabe. They're there as well. So everybody on the screen, if you're watching, they're all there at yeah. the Waterfall Bar. What has been noted in the week of testimony is that when Karen came in, she had a glass mm -hmm. with her. She had just come from a previous bar across the street. She walks over. She has a glass like under her coat, almost as if she's like sneaking it in. Mm -hmm. A couple people notice it. They kind of laugh. Ha ha. He he. You brought a glass in. Um, and then the night kind of continues. They're talking. Everything's fine. Everybody has testified that there's no beef, animosity. There's nothing. Around midnight, people are leaving. Yep. Chris Albert, who again is the brother of Brian, the owner of 34 Fairview. Chris Albert walks home, okay, to his house, which is apparently six minutes away. Mm -hmm. Julie Albert, which is Chris's wife, she had left beforehand because she had a headache. So those two, and this is what we were going to do. Oh, I'm not going to be able to do it from here. So the if you're watching, top left people, they go home. Yeah. Everybody, or top, I mean, bottom right people, Karina and Nicholas, the third party people who had come, they also go home. Yep. Everybody else on here goes to 34 Fairview. Yes. Okay. So one, two, three, four. How many is that? Eight? Actually, no. Caitlin Albert's boyfriend, Tristan Morris, he also goes home. Yes, he drops her he off. He drops her off, and then he goes home. Yep. Okay, so the next slide here, you can see in the background, shout out to Brandy and Church for the, for the images, okay? In the background, you see a house. That's 34 Fairview. So these are all of the people who go to the house. And they all come to the house a little after 12 mm -hmm. is what happens, okay? There's some dispute about the timing. We're get, we'll get into that. But everybody goes to the house. The general testimony is that they were all in the kitchen-ish area on the main level, mm -hmm. talking, hanging out, and between 12 and 2, yep. people in and out, and they start to leave, okay? they mm -hmm. Everybody's socializing, having a good time, and then eventually people start to leave. Caitlin Albert, who is the daughter of Brian and Nicole, again, the owners of 34 Fairview, she is the last person to leave that night, and... She leaves closer to 2 o'clock, 2 a.m. Yeah. in the morning. Her boyfriend comes back. Her boyfriend comes back to pick her pick up. Pick her up, yep. Everyone who left that house and has testified thus far say that they have never seen, never saw. They were, it was snowing and there was nobody in the snow out. Nobody saw a body. Nobody saw a glass. And nobody saw 45 pieces of a red tail light in the snow. And nobody saw John O'Keefe in the house. And and they all say John never came in. That's what everybody so that's, that's says. That's the general, general consensus. Yes. Also, Colin Aber, Albert, the, the, who is that? That Chris, that's Chris' son, right? Yeah. Chris and. Yeah, we're going to get, you're talking about the video we're going to play? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So everybody at some point leaves the mm -hmm. house. And what the next thing we know is that at 6.03 the next morning, Kate, Karen Reed, Jen McCabe, and another woman who's not on here, Carrie Roberts, are all outside of 34 Fairview the next morning, 6.03 a.m., screaming and on the phone with police because they have discovered John's body in front of the very house that they left four hours ago, essentially. Yeah. And so that is what we know. Now, when you start to get to the details, it gets a little shaky. 
crazy, crazy. So we have some videos uh, that we are going to walk through some of the like issues that have been presented in the case. Here we go. Uh, I'm probably going to have to fast forward just a little bit. Mr. Day, Jimmy got out of prison. Who is that? What is that? That's for myself. During the course of that road trip. Here we go. Um, during the course of that road trip or at the hillside. Context. This is Brian Albert testifying. This is Brian Albert. He is, again, the owner of 34 Fairview. He is a Boston. Retired police officer. Retired police officer. Okay. Did the two of you discuss Karen Reed, my client? No. Did her name ever come up? No. Did he mention the fact that he had been texting and flirting with Karen Reed two weeks prior? No. So that subject, according to you, was never addressed or broached by Mr. Higgins or you? No. After so context is Brian Higgins, the ATF agent, and Brian Albert, the owner of 34 Fairview, had come from a, another police officer, like a fallen officer in New York. They road trip on January 28th. They road trip back to Massachusetts and they go to a bar. They're hanging out all day mm -hmm. drinking, essentially. What Karen's attorney just asked him is, did Brian Higgins mention to you by chance that he had been flirting, flirting and texting Karen Reed? Mm. At any point in time, was that brought up? And then he goes into when you guys went to the bar and Karen and John came in together. Did he mention to you there? Did he have an issue with the fact that the woman he had just been texting just showed up with her boyfriend and that may be a little uncomfortable? Was that ever brought up? And Brian Albert is like, no, no. And the reason that's important. Because I've been looking for a reason. And it goes back to the opening statement. Yes. And the opening statement, the state did a terrible job, but they kind of snuck in the fact that there had been this, this texting situation yeah. between brian higgins and karen reed yep which, so, which gives them some type of motive some kind of mo so then it's like okay was there a beef between john o'keefe and brian higgins yes potentially or Over a lady did karen reed is that the reason she never went to the house that night did she really say i'm not going in because that was going to be uncomfortable for mm. her was she trying to leave i don't was she trying to leave john and get with that would seem stu a stupid way to go about it. But the fact that they brought that up just feels like a nugget that the defense is going to, when it's their turn, they're going to come back around. They're going to come it. back around. That's how it feels. Because you said y'all didn't talk about her. Yes. And you said it wasn't an issue. But wait. But wait. Just wait. Uh, okay. So then the next thing is, again, it has to do with the timing that everybody left the bar. Yeah. So let me play the clip. The person that we're going to see first is, uh, I think it's it's going to be Chris Albert, who is Brian Albert's brother, and his wife talking about, he. Uh, Chris Albert is the one who walked from the bar to his house, mm -hmm. and they're talking about the time that he arrived at home. They say a certain time, but Karen's attorneys say a different time. Oh, oh. no. The tape say a different time. Testified on direct examination. You thought you got home between 12.05 and 12.10 a.m. on January 29th. That's what I remember. If I suggested to you that you didn't even leave the bar until 12.13 a.m., would you quarrel with that? No, I guess not. I mean, I believe it's me. Having now viewed that Indeed. video with the timestamp of 12.13 and about 43 seconds or so. Does that refresh your memory as to when you left the waterfall? Yes. You testified on direct examination right. that Chris came home at 12.10 a.m. on January 29th. That's the time I believe he did, yes. That 12.10 a.m. time, did you discuss that precise time with anybody prior to taking the stand yesterday? No. Was that coordinated with anybody such that your husband and you gave the same time at 12.10 a.m.? No. <laughs> this is funny. Watch it, adults. Yes, I believe it's my husband. Uh, would you agree with me that your husband left the waterfall at about 12, 13, and 46 seconds? Well, yes. I mean, that's what it says on the screen. Wait. 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 <laughs> They be catching them lying. Just and the problem is, they said he got home at twelve ten. Yeah. Then they show video that he left the bar mm -hmm. at twelve thirteen, and then 
Did y'all coordinate that? No. The what? I, I, we would never coordinate. Wait, I think that might be him. After that, the oh. wife got home and she was like, <laughs> Listen. You, they got us on tape. How come nobody thought about this part? <laughs> I said, oh, wait. The lawyer's like, now, hold on. So y'all didn't coordinate. So y'all, no. And she's like, no. So let me show you the same piece of video straight. that I just showed your husband that shows him leaving at 12, 13. Okay, so then he didn't get home at 12, 10. Maybe it was a little bit later. Well, obviously he got home at that time because yeah. that's the time on the TV. And, and I uh, think that this timing matters because they are all trying to, uh, this is my opinion, okay? It seems like they were all trying to stick to this generalized timing. Yep. So that they can say everybody was home in bed. Who knows how he got out there at two o'clock in the morning? Because we was all at the house sleep by that mm. time. So they're trying to like coordinate this time. But then it just blew up a little yep. bit in their face. Because the next part after saying he got home at 1210, the next thing that they were able to say is, Chris got home at 1210 after walking from the bar. And 10 minutes later, their son, Colin Albert, who was at 34 Fairview, he came home. So mm -hmm. that would mean 1210. That means Colin is home by 1220, 1225. But if you say he didn't leave till 12, if you say Chris didn't leave till 1213 and he didn't get home till 1220, that now means Colin Albert, mm -hmm. even if he got home 15 minutes later, now you're talking about 1245. You're yep. talking about closer to one. To one o'clock. You're shifting the entire night to later mm -hmm. than they want to they wanna show. Yeah. So when they get home. Well, when they get to the Albert's house, everybody says that um, Colin left as soon as they yeah. got in. He was barely there. He was barely there, right? So they walk in, and Colin's walking out. That's what everybody's saying. Uh, come to find out, no one saw him leave. But to if you listen to their uh, testimonies, it's almost as if they're in the doorway and they're watching him walk out the house. But if you ask everyone, everyone says, no, we did not physically see him leave. He only said he was going to wait on his ride, right? So then you get to the police reports. When you came home, you would agree with me that your son Colin Albert was not home, correct? Not when I first got home. I think your testimony was 10 minutes after you got home, he opened the bedroom door? I think that's what I said, yeah. Do you want to stick with that? I'm just trying to recollect what I, you Did know, you thinking it over. So obviously it was a little bit longer. Then my son was sitting there with his two friends and my nephew Colin, who is Julie and Chris's son, didn't realize he was there. I said, oh, hey, you know, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, I just stopped by to see Brian, but I'm about to leave. My ride's about to be here. Notably. Did you tell Trooper Proctor that Colin Albert was present at your house? You know, I probably didn't because anytime I was questioned about who was there, who, to me it was who was there afterwards hanging out from like the 1215 point on. I didn't consider Colin as being there because I literally crossed paths with him. At no point, isn't it true that at no point during that interview did you admit or mention that Colin Albert had been at the house that night? I don't believe I did, no. Is there a reason that you left his name out? Because he, he wasn't there. He left when we got there. He wasn't there for the duration of the of the time that we had that night. So the lawyers are the scent. They got the scent now. Why are you all covering up for Colin? Yeah. What What is happening and why is this? Now, uh, Colin used to, back to your story about the... Uh, Cutting through people's yard. Oh. <laughs> Colin used to cut through uh, John O'Keefe's yeah. lawn, uh -huh. and they they said it was a joke and blase blase. But John O'Keefe did his duty. What was it? What was legal the, duty. His legal duty, <laughs> and he put up a fence, right? So apparently, he did have an issue with, with this kid cutting, cutting through, through his, his grass yard. or whatever. So um, that's their. The lawyers are trying to say, well, there was a little beef there between Colin and O'Keefe. Um, does but... does all this? Co okay, so leaving him out of the police report, 
never mentioning that he was there. And then when they start to mention he was there, they're all saying, yeah, but he was leaving as soon. And then she was so specific with, I just assumed they meant like anyone who was there beyond 1215. But again, that goes back to that time frame of them saying he was home by this time. Yeah, but now if everything shifts to later, that means Colin was at that house later. Do you feel like they're covering because he did something or do you feel like they're covering because he's a child and as a parent, you just want to protect your child and keep them away from a, a murder investigation? Like I can understand no. as a parent covering, but is it, it did he do something or are y'all just trying to protect your children? There he did something. <laughs> <laughs> allegedly i don't i don't yeah allegedly i don't i don't see why you would uh go through so much trouble not to include this man when he, i mean he's your relative it, it would seem second nature oh yeah colin was there such and such was there blase blase was there whatever yeah. but what they all have consistently done they all have not put uh mentioned this to the um investigator yeah so I can see if one or two missed it, but everybody mentioning it, yeah, they don't talked about it. They were like, look, do not mention Colin at all. He won't be a suspect at all to keep him out of you know harm's way. Yeah. Um. Also, Colin is a six foot something oh, football big... player. Y yeah. And they said he wait no Brian Albert. I thought oh no maybe it's Colin. It's Colin. Well, Colin... Brian Albert. I think Brian Albert Jr. testified. Mm -hmm. That's a big boy. Yeah. 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 This, but if you look, if you put that picture, if you put the diagram up, you look at Colin, he got his shirt off, and you see his show, hey, he's all like big news, yeah. So, uh, he was like in high school, yeah, During yeah. The, I think he was 17, yeah, 17, something like 18, that. something like that. Um, so it seems like they're trying to uh cover something up or just not even have him in the store so he won't even be thought about but they messed up because these lawyers are they're clever so good and good and they're like hold up listen y'all ain't mentioning him for a reason let's let's figure out why and the scent they on to him if so. i i never plan on being in trouble if i ever get in trouble i need david yanetti and alan jackson as my attorneys because not only are they good and poking holes, they're funny. They are funny. They be in there acting up. You want you gonna stick with that? They be in there acting. You mm -hmm. gonna, that's what you want to stick with. I'm giving you the opportunity to change your story now. Mm -hmm. You don't want to stick with that. All right, now I'm finna embarrass you. And then they just be like, hit play, please. Hit yep. the, play the clip. Is that you? You know, I believe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go ahead to the next. Who is that right there? I yeah. think that's my husband. Oh yeah. We've been married thirty years. Twelve, that thirteen. 12 13 would you would yeah. you say you left at 12 13 now damn right uh anyway so on top of that mm -hmm. um the defense has been trying to say this is you know uh karen is being framed and why would you think he she's being framed or whatever so they're proving their point of the Alberts being well connected to everybody to everybody so this is why they would be frank be framing this is uh, how even Karen, yeah. This is how they'll be doing because everybody's in on it. Every, like <laughs> everybody that you can think of. So uh, back in the day, Chris Albert, okay, was getting in some trouble. He was getting in a fight with the Lapaloso brothers, and Lieutenant Lank came and activated himself. Oh my goodness! And protected Chris Albert. Second incident: another Albert brother got into a car wreck, hit and run. Lank. The, the the same police officer followed the car to the house, found out who did it. They pressed charges on the Albert brother, but later on, the charges were dropped. Okay? So now you have a, a consistent history of Link protecting these guys, doing things for them just because he know them. They, they all cool. And they, they all have been knowing each other for 20 year. plus years. Yeah. So then the uh, chief, he's the one that found all of the um, uh, what is it, the, the tail, tail light, light. Uh, yeah, in on. the yard. Oh, sorry, I was I'm gonna play the video. Uh, Mr. Albert, that's uh, obviously you on the right, and Kenny Berkowitz on the left. Correct. I believe that's my fundraiser for when I was running for the select board. Part of your duties as a town selectman is to oversee the Canton Police Department. Correct. I'm recently elected, so I'm just going through it. But yeah, I believe so. We 
<laughs> the sheriff is at his campaign. The police chief. The police chief <laughs> is at his campaign donating and contributing to his campaign. And he um, also just happens to be the person who found, who discovered the pieces of, the of Karen's uh, taillight on the property of 34 Fairview a week, four days after he, his body was discovered. He was just driving by. He's like, let me just drive by to see if I see anything since it's gotten hotter and the uh, snow is yeah, melted. Everything's let me melted. see if I can see anything. And, and he all finds, of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, I and don't, guess who he calls, though? Yeah. He calls Officer Lane. He does. He don't even he, he and then they get up there and then they call somebody else to come bag it up now. It don't make sense. But somebody is saying, what is a selectman? I have no idea. I actually I'm like, did y'all make this up in Canton? I don't know what a selectman is. But what I do know based off of the questions is that they somehow oversee the police department. Which so is you wild. Need to tell me your buddy buddy with the police chief. And now this role that you recently uh, been been uh I'm figuring it out. Yeah, you're you're now on this selectman board and you're like, I don't know what the duties are, but maybe it has to do with with overseeing police. <laughs> maybe and it just so happened a dead body was found in the yard of my brother's house and I my role is to oversee police. Uh what's his name? Chris Chris Albert's wife, Julie. She is it Julie? Yep. Yeah Julie. She um is best friends with Proctor. Proctor is the investigator, lead invest investigator. the lead investigator investigating everything. His sister is best friends with the Alberts, with Julie Albert. She watches their children. Yeah. So, like, there you go again. There's another connection of why all these people would be um, plotting against Karen. Also, they were trying to say that um, Julie... Well, Julie was trying to downplay her relationship with Proctor's sister. That's going to be right. Do you that you were very close with Courtney Proctor? No. You also talk by phone? Very rarely. Uh, fair to, did you say very rarely? You talk phone. Usually, Proctor by usually phone? it's text. Were you using Courtney Proctor as an intermediary to communicate with Michael Proctor about this case? No, I was not. Are you aware that between February... First of 2022 and September 6th of 2022, you and Courtney Proctor spoke by phone 67 times. You still want to maintain your testimony that you only talk very rarely with Courtney Proctor during that time period. Listen, he said, so do you talk to her very rarely? And so did you say very rarely? What do you, did you not know we got your records? Do you know how this works? Did you just say very rarely? Oh, and then my he just goodness. repeated it the whole time he kept, uh, he was interviewing, I mean, uh, asking her questions. Very, how would you define very, very rarely. rarely? Do you talk to your mom very rarely? I said, this mm -hmm. is, this is. I don't even know what I would be doing on the stand if somebody caught me in a lie like that. I would be like, oh, shoot. Oh, so you so you know, you already know what I did. OK, I don't I don't know. That's what they told me to say. We had a family meeting and they told me to lie. And so I'm lying. That's what I'm waiting on. Somebody to just break down like that. But 67 times mm -hmm. in a period of like seven months. Yep. Is that a lot? Uh, I think that's de a decent amount. And then she also included that she texts her as well. Yeah. So. I mean, you add that with the text. And that's so funny. When you say, have you talked to somebody? No, I haven't talked to them, but I, I've texted them. You talk to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Texting is yeah. talking. Eh, come on, man. Yeah. Stop playing. 100%. Yeah. We should, I should look up how many times I've talked to people that I would consider very rarely. Like I would, I should see in a span of seven months how long or how many times I spoke to them. You know, just uh -huh. to like gauge if it's 67 times in seven months. A lot because that essentially is that's one time. Oh, dang, no, oh, don't yeah, that's dog. 10 times in a month. Yeah, it's 10 times a month. That's a lot. That's a lot. 10 times a month is a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a lot. For, for a friend, how many that's like a third of the month. Mm -hmm. If you're doing if you're saying 67 okay. times All in right. seven months, All right. that's 10. That's 10 <laughs> that's times a, in a month. That's a lot. Not including your texting since y'all want to yeah, divide yeah. that up. All right. I agree. Yeah. All right. I'd be trying to, you know, see both sides, but I, 
I, I sorry. Uh, okay, the next clip, um, I think, are again the Alberts. And what happens is the following morning after John is discovered, uh, <clears throat> Jennifer McCabe, who is the sister to the owner of the house, she busts in the house, goes upstairs to their room, and basically is like, John's dead outside. Come outside. So one of the things that has been raised is her a bit, how she just like entered their house and went upstairs, essentially. Um, so here is a clip of them talking about that. We have five kids. Everyone's coming in and out at different times. Like the last person in was supposed to lock it. Immediately the keys got lost. It was just always a disaster. With So a lot of times the door was just kind of left unlocked. Yes, from time to time, um, the doors, people would just forget to lock them or we just didn't lock them. They're leaving it. <laughs> They're leaving it open for anything to happen. A family of law enforcement. He's an officer. Uh, yeah, man. His brother is an officer. Yeah. His other brother is the selectman, whatever that means. But being a selectman, you're over officers. And, and you, you know, you know the dangers that are out there. You have went to investigations, crimes, where people have been harmed. And you tell them you leave your door open with unlocked with your children inside. Adult children. Who are eight? Okay, if you're talking about our daughter who's seven, sure. You're talking about 16, 17, 18, 20 plus because Caitlin now lives with her boyfriend. And so you mean to tell me you have five almost grown children and they're not locking the door, and you, as adults and also a police officer, is not reminding them and instilling into them that they need to lock your front door? What got me? That is silly. Oh, the keys just got lost. So, yeah. you know, we just were most always, of the time we just leave the door unlocked. Always leaving keys. I, that doesn't make sense to oh, me. Oh, man. As a juror, I would be like, you're playing in my face and I don't appreciate that. Like, stop. Yes. You think I'm dumb? Yes. They're, they're just somewhat, they're setting themselves up to say anything, really, where anything could have happened because the doors are unlocked. We don't know who came in. We don't know who went out. We, we just leave the doors unlocked. So, whatever happened, he might have came in when we were all asleep because the doors stay unlocked. And I'm not, I recognize, let me be clear, because I recognize that there are people and there are communities in which people don't lock their door consistently. I ain't never been in one of those communities, but I recognize that that is a reality that some people have. What I am saying is hard for me to, to reconcile mm -hmm. is that a police officer who comes from a family of police officers mm -hmm. would subscribe to not locking their doors, yeah. to not doing a check yeah. of the house before they go to bed, yeah. to make sure doors are locked, windows are closed. That is what I'm saying I'm not able to put together, okay? That's that. That's not computing for me. Man, do y'all do that? Because I get up. I mean, it could be 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and I just get up, and I just go check doors, and I come back to bed. Let's, it just happens. Ha it just happens. I, it's just like something in me. I, I was, know. this is a slight pivot, but I was looking at uh, the Jeezy and Jeannie Mai. They're going through a divorce. It's very messy. It's a lot. I look at the documents. If you're on Patreon, you know that I post the documents. It's a mess. Check but one of the um, things that was put into one of the documents is this image of Jeezy walking around his house with a very large gun. And she in her documents, the way it came across is that Jeezy is this violent person who carries around guns and it's, you know, very scary. And then he came back and was like, that's my security camera from inside my house. And basically I was doing my midnight check and I had come from downstairs or upstairs and I was going downstairs to put the weapon back in the safe is what happened. But I did my checks with it in my hand and in the video, in the clips that he, he actually provided a full video. He grabbed some tea and he had, it was like a full on AK. Okay. <laughs> this nigga had, I didn't mean to say that, but he had some tea and an AK and he, and it likes some draws and he just like, oh. Doors yep. locked, doors locked. And then he heads downstairs and or wherever he was going and does what he does. Anyway, the point is, it's very hard for me to believe that people, particularly police officers, are not doing checks of their house and making sure that everything is shut down and locked down, especially if you're an officer and you have your family, your wife, your children. It just would be wildly irresponsible. But you know. Whatever. Whatever. If that's what you say. Uh, okay, the next one is the dog. 
Yes. We got to talk about Chloe. So Chloe has an issue with <laughs> other dogs, apparently. And uh, they got rid of this dog. Wait, no, we're not there yet. No? No. We're oh, talking about the We're dog. talking about the dog and the dog sleeping yes. right next to the window. Mind you, it's a ger they have a German shepherd. Yep. Okay. German shepherd Chloe, who they testify that the night everybody came to the house mm -hmm. was barking, was, you know, causing all this ruckus, whatever, to the point where Brian Albert takes Chloe upstairs to be removed from the environment of the party. He testifies to she was barking she because was barking. a lot of people were because downstairs. A lot of people. Yep. And so then they say the next morning when Karen Reed is outside screaming about finding her boyfriend on the front lawn, mm -hmm. there's six police vehicles, mm -hmm. whether we're talking ambulance, fire trucks, whatever. All of this is happening outside. Brian is asleep. Nicole is asleep. And the dog don't, is not saying a peep. And the dog is, and you all, Let me, if you look at the videos, when the uh, police officers are pulling up to the scene, man, you see these lights. They are bright, it's bright, six bright. In the morning. Just bright. And you all also know the ones that have pets. Well, you don't even need no pet. You walk up to somebody's house and before you ring the doorbell, the dogs sense you. They we, know you're there. Before we just you even said you got to put beware of dogs. Yes, it's because dogs react. They know. Typically, before you even there, they know you're there. Apparently, Chloe didn't react. Here's the video. Chloe, where were you at six o three on the morning of January 29, twenty nine, twenty two? I was sleeping in my room. Was Nicole in bed with you? Yes. Had you taken any medication the night before? No. Were you on any sedatives? No. Sleeping pills. No. Were you wearing a sleep apnea machine? No. Were you wearing an eye mask? No. Were you wearing earplugs? No. You were aware that there were three women on your lawn at one point? And at least one of those women was screaming to the top of her lungs? Your German shepherd was six feet from the window, correct? Um, I don't know that for sure. That's if, where Matt was. Well, that doesn't mean that's where she always is. She also sleeps in the closet area sometimes. Oh, so now Chloe's in the closet. I didn't say she was in the closet. I said she sleeps in the closet area sometimes. Was she sleeping in the closet area that morning? I don't remember. Oh, so now Chloe's in the closet. Uh huh. Okay, so she wasn't barking, and because she was in the closet, that's what you want me to believe, sir. Get out of here! Man. Oh my God! And then the Albert's window faces the street. Yes. So anything outside is going to be reflecting on the inside of their room. They didn't have no blackout curtains. They could see those lights, man. And you know that dog was going crazy. And then he went through a list. So, where did you take some sedatives? The sleep. Did you machine. have a sleep mask? Was, did you have sleep apnea? <laughs> what would have prevent? And also, okay, six o'clock in the morning. What is your typical time of waking up? Because I I sleep late. First of all, I get up. However, I wake up when you have children. You know, yo, you don't be in deep sleep because you be concerned about your kids. Mm -hmm. What kind of came in the room last night? We heard footsteps. We were like, "What is that?" She's you tip crap it, out of me. And you put a German Shepherd dog on top of that. Yep. And you want us to believe you was in their sleep because the yep. blinds was closed. And, and Chloe was in the closet. That dog was up and Absolutely. going. Absolutely. Going crazy. Uh, let's play the next one. We run out of time. Okay. Moved in April of 2023. We had always planned to move, but it was it was in our plans that, you know, what kids were starting to get older, we were looking to possibly downsize. So they end up selling the home. I thought they sold the home, like, immediately after this mm -hmm. situation. And... I can under, well, I thought I could understand because they moved an entire year after the uh, event. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh, I'll give you that. You moved a year after. But to be honest with you, usually it takes a year to find a home or longer than that. It all depends. It you depends, could, yeah. yeah, it could take seven months to find that home. I guess it could take one month to find yeah, the home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I don't know now. Now that I was thinking about it, I think, um, it could go both ways on that one. I think what I what stuck out to me about them selling the house, of course, it had it was a, a house that their like grandparents had built. Mm -hmm. It had been in the O'Keefe family for years, decades. Uh, and then this family moved in, but like they raised their kids in that home. Like yep. everybody lived in this home. And so John O'Keefe is found dead in January of 2022. Mm -hmm. The house is put on the market in November of 2022, and it's not sold until April of 23, okay. but they put it up in November. So okay. it's like, okay, not 10 months essentially between when this happened, whatever. But the thing that 
Uh, Because I was like, that is a long time. Like, is it reactive to what happened? And they're trying to, you know, prevent being investigated. However, if Karen Reed was the one who was indicted initially and then, you know, accused of this crime and is going through this process, if they thought the heat was off of them, Mm -hmm. they didn't think they needed to sell the house. Mm. It would, in my mind anyway, as time progresses and Turtle Boy gets to doing, dot, you know, a yep. web page and blowing this case up and the heat starts to be on them, mm-hmm. that it makes me wonder, oh, did they start getting nervous then? And now they're like, let me get rid of this house. And so that could, exp- it could, I'm not saying it does, but it could explain the the gap in when the incident happened and when they actually put it up for my See, I couldn't be a juror. Could you, that's, I'm easily swayed. <laughs> That makes well, plenty of sense. That I makes mean, plenty of sense to me. Well, y'all thought you got away with it, and now it's like, oh snap! And now let's we get gotta, rid of the house. Yep. Um, That's what jumped off. Okay, but then we gotta talk about the dog because they got rid of Chloe. Let's play the clip, and then we can oh, go. Oh my into goodness! It. Okay. We learned that there were questions being raised about John's injuries and dog bites and scratches. In May of 2022, you got rid of that dog, did you not? Chloe was rehomed in May 2023. Whatever words we want to, rehomed, rehoused, whatever. But you got rid of her. She's no longer part of the Albert family, right? In May of 2022, four months after Mr. O'Keefe's death, you got rid of your family dog of six years. I did not get rid of my dog. I rehomed my dog. In one incident in May of 22, when she got out and was fighting with another dog, the woman who was dog it was tried to break up the two dogs and while she was trying to break up the two dogs she got injured that rehome you are not homeless the- you're right. unhoused absolutely there are proper terms and the mm-hmm. alberts was gonna correct him that man said you can use whatever term you want to use you got rid of your dog yeah you, you don't got that dog no more Chloe not in the house is that she? dog ain't an albert no more <laughs> that's exactly that's he's mind. not a part of the albert family anymore Get out of here. Un- what? Rehome? Rehome. We rehomed her. That was funny. Uh, but the, the next one is the video because I think over the course of the week, this was like a big hit for me. The video that they played. Yes. So uh, the the lawyers, the defense, they, they have to have something in their back pocket because they keep uh, talking about this basement yeah. situation. Yeah, they do. So then they, um, they show a video of the basement. How it's set up, how how you get out of the basement, where it leads to, and where how how convenient it is to where uh, John O'Keefe's body ends up. Go ahead. So the bulkhead door opens straight up. So that's the backyard. And it exits out right in the front. And that is the location of where John's body was found. So it's just a convenient route, route, route. Yeah. To, to, and you, I don't know how it could have uh, happened, but you're in the backyard where the dog might have been. And downstairs they had weights, heavy weights. So um, there was also an injury to uh, John. Yep. That could have been you know a heavy object so the f- it, it, that was big for me because it it you could see them putting him using that route to put him there oh but yeah the question is if you're only going to put him in the front yard do you have to be sneaky about it you know what i'm saying like do you have to but i guess if you're in the basement that it ju- that's just the way that makes sense but it's yeah. just like you put him in the front yard uh we're running out of time so i'm gonna skip because i want to get to the phone he basically brian albert owner of the house uh, talks about leaving his phone in his bed. Uh, okay. Kind of a habit I do. I put my reading glasses and my phone in bed with me. Sometimes I charge it, but not as a routine, no. That night, the phone was on the, on the bed. You have a specific recollection from two and a half years ago about the state of the battery charge on your phone such that you know it was in your bed that night. No, I just know as, as a routine, I keep my phone in the bed with me. Yes, mostly every night. And you know what I'm about to ask you, why you're saying you sleep with the phone in the bed, correct? Yeah. All right, so I s- that's, that's sustained. What else is in the bed with you? Your keys, your wallet, any other pocket item? No. Sir, did you make any phone calls after you went to bed between the hours of 1.45 a.m. and 6.30 a.m.? I inadvertently called Brian Higgins. 2.22 
in 35 seconds. Yes. How did you inadvertently call him? Well, I don't know because it was inadvertent. Well, it's kind of like a butt dial. Your testimony, let me just ask. Is sure. Is your testimony that you and your wife were in the middle of some sort of sexual or intimate situation, and that's what caused you to butt dial the phone at that time at 2.22 a.m.? Objection. Who else was in the room? Just myself and my wife. And Chloe? Yes. But Chloe's not a human, so it was myself and my wife. By process of elimination, Nicole didn't answer that call, did she? No. Chloe, a non-human, didn't answer that call, did she? No. So who had to have answered the call, sir? I don't remember answering that call. Could have hit the phone by accident, causing it to answer. Listen. That's what I said. I said it's a booty call. It's literally a booty call. <laughs> yes, I was screaming. We, the way phones work, butt dialing is not really even a thing anymore. It's not even a no. thing anymore because the phones lock. Yep. Maybe taking a photo because sometimes you can like do stuff when your phone is locked and take a picture, but calling is just not really. Yeah. I don't know. It was it was crazy. So I'm not convinced. A lot of people have been saying they want to vote now. They want to be the jurors and be able to vote now because not guilty and actually them other people is guilty. So the weigh in, we uh got to go because somebody else got to come in here and record. But weigh in in the comments. Let us know. If you're ready to vote uh, and if any of the things that at least we highlight highlighted, if you feel different, if there are things we're not thinking about, we're going to be watching, of course, uh, more of the trial. We'll be back yep. next week to rec uh, to go over what happens for the next week. Uh, join the Patreon if you're not, because I also want to do a live. I want to live watch it one of the days of the trial with everybody. We're going to figure that out. We're, we're going to figure get it that out. Done. Um, so anyway, I hope y'all are tuning in. This has been interesting, but also mm -hmm. a mess. Uh, I'm not lawyer, but on all the platforms. I'm Goose B G O L Z B Y on IG. Building with Goose on YouTube. Let us tell it on the YouTube as well. Amen.